My apologies for not being there in person. So many of you are old and good friends. I miss being able to shake your hand or embrace. Uh, but the altitude is a problem for me. I do give about 10 lectures a year, but not at high altitude. So I hope this will work. At this point, it's really hard for me to separate which are the ideas originated with me, which with the Dalai Lama. Uh, the ones with Darwin are easy because they're all quotes from text. Um, I've met with the Dalai Lama a total of about 60 hours in one-on-one -on -one conversation. Most recently, in January of this year, we met in New Delhi, and I discussed many of these same ideas with him, and new ideas emerge. So some of what you'll get is the old ideas and some the new ideas. So let me give you a working definition of compassion, which has two parts. The first is the concern, the wish, the desire, the motive to relieve suffering. And the second is the action that actually attempts to or does succeed in relieving suffering. Does compassion embrace both? Well, let's consider that issue further. Do you need, does concern equal the suffering oneself? That is, when you feel concern for someone who is suffering, are you feeling exactly what they are feeling? The Dalai Lama believes you are not. You feel something, but it is not in his view exactly uh, what the other person is feeling. A second question, and I don't think there's an answer to this, a definitive answer as yet from uh, empirical research. Second question is, can you, does the action that actually attempts to relieve suffering, that, does that always require first the concern? And again, I don't think we know the answer to that. What we do know is that all of us living in industrial societies experience repeated exposures to suffering. We probably see more suffering in a week than our ancestors in hunter-gatherer societies saw in a lifetime. And what is the consequence of observing so much suffering that we can do nothing about? It isn't within a hundred or a thousand or five thousand miles of us. What does that do to our brain. Again, I hope you people know the answer or will th think this is a question that merits answering. One more question uh, out of the many that exist, and that is, does anticipating and preventing suffering, does that qualify as a compassionate act? Certainly a lot of what I did as a parent wasn't relieving suffering, it was preventing suffering. Wear a helmet, you know, uh, watch out for hard drugs. Those are all warnings to prevent suffering. It wasn't the actual relieving of suffering. And yet I consider that was compassionately, it was compassionate action and compassionately motivated. And so that of course brings me to the question, of what motivates a compa compassionate concern. And here, amazingly enough, amazing to me at least, is that Darwin and the Dalai Lama have exactly the same view. And I know that Dalai Lama didn't know Darwin's view. And the research I've done, historical research, uh, pretty much verifies that Darwin did not know anything about Buddhism when he first came to the view that I'm about to quote. And now I quote Darwin. You can read along with me. It's the only time I'll read PowerPoints is when I'm reading Darwin. We are impelled to relieve the suffering of another in order that our own painful feelings may be at the same time relieved. The mere sight of suffering, independently of love, would suffice to call up in us vivid recollections and associations. In other words, what motivates us is that it hurts us. It makes us suffer when we see someone suffer. So if we relieve their suffering, we won't suffer. 
Now look how similar the Dalai Lama's view, I guess I'll read this one too. In the human mind, seeing someone bleeding and dying makes you uncomfortable. That's the seed of compassion. We are thus impelled to relieve suffering of another in order that our own painful feelings may be at the same time relieved. Now, I'm going to describe to you four different types of compassion, a sort of short typology of compassion. And I'll start with what the Dalai Lama calls the root or seed, which is familial compassion. That is, compassion that is directed at immediate members of our family. Now, I believe that's a given, that that's not learned. It's part of our nature to feel compassion, at least towards the helpless infant. Do we feel as much towards the 40-year-old offspring as we do towards the six-month-old infant that 40-year-old once was? I don't know the answer to that question. I would like to know the answer to that question. Do we feel as much compassion to the six-month-old cousin as we do to the six-month-old offspring? That is, does the closeness of the blood relationship, genetic relationship, is, does that determine? Or is it an all-or-nothing phenomena for at least part of life, at least the early part of life? Again, maybe you people already know the answers, and I'll look forward to learning them, and if you don't, I hope you'll take on the task of answering this, because familial compassion is the easiest to study. It's all around us. Now, the next question I want to deal with is whether familial compassion is an emotion. I know a number of the people at this conference say yes. Let me tell you why I say no. At the top of the page are characteristics of emotion. Uh, I've described this in other papers earlier. And the ones at the top, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them are found in compassion. Uh, perhaps the only one that needs an explanation, for those of you that aren't familiar with my work, is this idea that when an emotion is first aroused, we have a filter a re that I've called a refractory period that focuses our attention both on the external and our retrieval of memories that fit the emotion, and everything else is largely ignored. Now, let's turn to the next, universal signal and distinctive physiology. I'm not convinced by the data I've seen so far that that's been established, but I know people are working on that. And that would be added then to the list of features that compassion shares with emotion. But let's consider in red the two that aren't going to change. In compassion, the target is constrained. It's members of the family, at least in familial compassion. The target, I can be angry at anybody or anyone. It, the target is totally unconstrained. I can be afraid of anything. Things that disgust me please my wife. So it's not constrained. And the second is that emotions can be enacted in either a constructive or destructive fashion. The Dalai Lama and I came to an agreed upon definition of how you distinguish the two. If the outcome of the emotional episode is to further collaboration between the people involved in that episode, then it's constructive. And if it interferes, then it's destructive. Now, compassion is not destructive. It is constructive. Now, in your wildest imagination, you might be able to think of some examples, but it's not the general characteristic. So here are two things that tell us compassion is different from emotion. In psychology, we used to distinguish between levelers and sharpeners those who like to make a lot of distinctions, or the sharpeners, I'm one of those. And those who like to simplify are the levelers, 
that's not what I'm going to be doing in this talk. Now, let's move to the second type of compassion, which isn't towards familial, but towards familiars, where you are concerned about your neighbors, your friends, your work associates, people you're familiar with. Now, this is common, but it's not universal. There are people who don't feel any compassion towards familiars. They're considered somewhat selfish people. They don't have a lot of friends. But it's by no means a universal. Familial is universal. Familiars is not. But what are the determinants of who feels familiar compassion? I don't know the answer. Again, I hope this conference will consider it. And for those who do feel familiar compassion, what establishes the boundaries? How widely does that net get cast? Stranger compassion. And again, I read to you Darwin. Many a civilized man or even boy who never before risked his life for another, but full of courage and sympathy, has disregarded the instinct of self-preservation and plunged at once into a torrent to save a drowning man, though a stranger. Now, stranger compassion is a continuum in terms of the scope, whether it's felt towards all strangers, in which case I would call it global compassion, or it's only on those who sim are similar in skin color, in language, in culture, uh, clearly, to feel it towards everyone in your culture is better than to feel it just towards familiars. It's an extension of compassion, but it isn't what most of the people uh, in this room are seeking. Uh, you're seeking global compassion, to feel compassion towards all human beings. And a second issue is how central is stranger compassion in your life? If you have it at all, is it something that just happens occasionally when you read about something in the newspaper or see it on TV? Or is your entire life dedicated to global compassion? There are some people like that, not as many as the world needs. Again, Darwin, a savage will risk his own life to save that of a member of the same community, but will be wholly indifferent about a stranger. A young and timid mother urged by the maternal instinct will, without a moment's hesitation, run the greatest danger for her own infant, but not of a mere fellow creature. So let's consider it now why stranger compassion is not an emotion. Earlier I told you that emotions can be enacted both constructively and destructively, but stranger compassion is only constructive. Everyone has emotions. They're universal. Regrettably, far from everyone has stranger or global compassion. Emotions initially distort perception uh, reportedly from people like Matthew Ricard and the Dalai Lama, perception is not distorted by compassion. And emotions typically begin without awareness of becoming emotional. That's not true of stranger or global compassion. And emotions can be out of control, and again, that does not seem characteristic of global compassion. So let me turn to a question that's been baffling me ever since I read the book by Kristen Monroe on altruism, where she studied people who had put their own life at risk, either momentarily or for a long period of time, to rescue those in danger, those who, if not rescued, would suffer and die. And there are such people. And as best as Monroe can determine, they don't differ from the rest of us in their upbringing, 
in their sex, in their age, in their politics. So what produces stranger compassion without training? Is it a chance event? Is it something to do with their upbringing? Is, it, is there some genetic determinant? The Dalai Lama believes it's their previous incarnation. Well, that's the only explanation that I reject because we have no way of really verifying that that occurs. Uh, there are some who would disagree with me, but not many. But I don't really think we understand, and I hope we will find out, more about the people who without any special training are compelled, just like the mother is compelled to rescue her infant that's in danger, they are compelled to rescue strangers. Now the last is in the, my typology is ascension compassion. And I'll read you what Darwin said about that. Sympathy beyond the confines of man, that is humanity to the lower animals, seems to be one of the latest moral acquisitions. This virtue, one of the noblest with which man is endowed, seems to arise incidentally from our sympathies becoming more tender and more widely diffused until they extend to all sentient beings. When I first read this quote to the Dalai Lama, they were amazed that Darwin used the term sentient beings, but indeed he did, and he didn't get it from the Buddhists. So I've presented to you a typology of compassion based in terms of the target. There are other ways one could create typologies of compassion. One could create it in terms of the compassionate person, the differences among the types of people. Or one could take things like whether or not it is heroic. Not all compassion, none of these four are necessarily heroic. Now here's a prediction of Darwin that he himself acknowledged has not been met. Compassion is of high importance to all those animals which aid and defend one another. It will have been increased through natural selection. For those communities <clears throat> which included the greatest number of the most sympathetic, and here I think he means compassionate, members would flourish best and rear the greatest number of offspring. Well, if Darwin had been correct, we'd be living in a world of total, of universal global compassion. And Darwin acknowledged that he was wrong. There are no countries today or in the known past, and this is Ekman, not Darwin, in which compassion and altruism towards strangers are shown by the overwhelming majority of the population. Darwin reasoned that it should be obvious that individuals should not be only compassionate to strangers in his nation, but to all people, to all nations. But he said, and now I quote Darwin, experience shows us how long it is before we look at all people as our fellow creatures. In closing, again, my apologies. I really wish I was there. I really wish I could talk to each and every one of you, both off stage, sharing a meal. I wish you a great conference. I think I'm going to have an opportunity to deal with some questions by Skype. I do want to tell you that I've been working for two years on a long essay that includes and elaborates and adds a number of concepts uh, and frameworks to our understanding of compassion, compassion. And that I'll also be producing what are called webisodes. The last six hours with the Dalai Lama were videotaped and we'll be producing some excerpts from that and putting them on the internet. And more information about my various activities, um, workshops, online training, and publications are all on my website, um, which is right at the moment being made more user-friendly. Again, my thanks. 
Have a great conference. I hope to see all of you in person soon. Goodbye now.